Hi, Alex here again with another episode of Was That Look Homoerotic or Has the Pandemic Warped My Sense of Intimacy? Today, we're going to cover another chapter in Marvel's somehow simultaneous failure in portraying both homo and heterosexuality. Before we get to that, we have to talk about this video sponsor, Scripps Untold Secrets. I know many of you, like me, like to live vicariously through fanfiction. And as people of refined taste, you'll also love living vicariously through the all-inclusive platform that is Scripps Untold Secrets. It is an interactive reading game platform that also allows users to create their own stories. You could make your own fanfiction come to life. The stories on Scripps Untold Secrets come in a myriad of themes. Everything from romance, adventure, horror, LGBTQ+, fantasy, comedy, suspense, and more. And let me just say, as someone who's played these interactive reading games before, Scripps Untold Secrets has an unprecedented experience for queer people. The app is super inclusive and even openly and intentionally queer, which is super awesome. Besides the huge selection of themes and genres, there's also a comment section where you can discuss plots with like-minded readers. In Scripps Untold Secrets, you can play the role of a famous best-selling novelist investigating their ex-girlfriend's mysterious death with their confidant. Cuck your own dad by competing to win his girlfriend's attention. If you like supernatural stories that don't queerbait you, enter a forbidden love between a vampire and a noble human. Your choices determine how the game ends. Plan your character's life, be it a domineering CEO, a gentle and lovely intern doctor, or a calm assassin, the choice is yours. If there aren't enough books for you, which is unlikely, you can alternatively create your own books. Create your own unique decisions to decide your character's fate and then share your books with the UGC community. Decide the number of chapters and choices you want readers to make and read what other characters have written. There's also a ton of events in the game. Use the link in the description to download the game, where you can enter giveaways to win things like Amazon gift cards and brand new iPhones. Also, check out the official Facebook and Twitter to catch up on game updates and participate in free diamond giveaways every week. Download the game now to get an exclusive pack worth $49.99 for free! I will see you there! Ah yes, Sam and Bucky, of recent Falcon and the Winter Soldier fame. There's nothing better than the Steve, Sam, and Bucky love triangle. By the end of this, we'll hopefully figure out what Anthony Mackie's been smirking at. If you don't know, Marvel's recent show, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, turned heads and sexualities with its portrayal of the relationship between the two leads, Sam, or the Falcon, and Bucky, or the Winter Soldier. Sam and Bucky. Just bros, or bros with gay woes. Well, unfortunately, I may be the only gay with woes today, as Marvel has demonstrated they kinda don't care about queer people. For Marvel, queerness is a rabbit hole. In this show, they use queerness as a tool, a talking point, bait. What Marvel did with Sam and Bucky was probably one of the most obvious examples of queer baiting I've seen since Teen Wolf. What's queer baiting? You ask instead of Googling. Well, put simply, it's a phenomenon where those associated with a piece of media, like a TV show, hint at the possibility of queerness in their text to attract queer audiences, but fail to follow through on actual representation. It's a way of winning over the gays without risking conservative viewers or possible censorship. So how do you even prove that those involved with Falcon and the Winter Soldier queerbaited? Well, first, let's break down what a classic queerbait looks like. Not all queerbaiting strictly follows these bullet points, but here are three things to look out for in a queerbait. Number one, the possibility of hinted queerness in text. So things like subtext, prolonged stares, parallels between canonical love interests and the characters in the queerbait, characters with commonly understood queer characteristics like crying to white girl music, and so on. Number two, legitimate sources like writers, producers, and actors hinting at queerness in the text. So in an interview, a writer might say something like, it's a complicated relationship, wait and see what happens, when asked about queerness between the characters. Actors might act playful around each other and play up their tension and mention the queerbaited relationship by name to attract attention around the queerness. Oh, vote for us. Uh, it's Teen Wolf uh, for best summer show. Yeah, Choice Teen Choice Summer Show. Something. And we'll take more naps like these for you. 
Derek all the way. It's like dangling a rainbow carrot or any other irrelevantly phallic object in front of the audience, only to snatch it away in the actual text of the show. And so the final bullet point, a large, probably queer fan base that supports queerness in text. Yeah, so like the Tumblr thing, but also not at all. It's a little deeper than that. But for simplicity's sake, let's just say that if a significant portion of your fan base enjoys the media because of a certain relationship, then the show often benefits or even depends on ambiguous queerness to encourage continued interest. I think the whole theme and cast thing has gotten a little out of proportion. <laughs> so let's look at Sam and Bucky. Let's look at the show, the surrounding media, and the history of the fan base behind these characters. Is this a story about queer baiting? Is it a story about queerios reading too much into innocent stares? When will gay people just let bros platonically fondle each other and finally release the heterosexual world from the chains of the homosexual agenda? If only. Let's start with the fan base. So queer baiting bullet point number three, a fan base to bait. If Sam and Bucky are a queer bait, then there should be a corresponding mass of people ferociously defending homoeroticism like ancient Greek philosophers, right? Well, the fan base around Sam and Bucky isn't exactly its own thing. Marvel inherited momentum from the pairing between Bucky and his closeted youth pastor boyfriend, Steve Rogers. This is the Stucky story. The relationship between Steve Rogers, or Captain America, and Bucky Barnes goes way back to the 1940s where Bucky first appeared as Steve's younger sidekick. Their relationship didn't really take on any bromosexual form until the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where suddenly Bucky and Steve appeared as young men of the same age. In the new movies, they were best friends. And by best friends, I mean friends of Dorothy. Marvel created a perfect storm for gayness, like a West Coast Starbucks. Their deep and personal bond attracted thousands of fans. Their unrelenting sacrifice for each other in the movies intrigued queer onlookers. I mean, here we had two men with a profound bond so deep that they would give up nearly anything for each other. Steve gave up his shield, his friends, his heterosexuality, all for Bucky. If you want to learn more, I actually made a video about them in 2016. Link in the description and my heart. Naturally, a huge fandom developed. The sacrifices and prolonged gay staring translated into hours poured into fan art, fan videos, and crying over fan fiction in the middle of the night. As of May 2021, there are 53,000 fan works on Archive of Our Own alone. 53,000. That's about the capacity of a large stadium. You could fill a baseball stadium with stories of dudes playing for the other team. A national pastime of dudes swinging that way. Take me out to the ball game? More like take me out of the closet. This giant massive energy didn't just exist in a vacuum on one corner of the internet. Multiple books and academic articles covered Stucky. Mainstream publications seriously discussed the phenomenon. In 2016, hashtag give Captain America a boyfriend trended on Twitter, prompting even more widespread attention. Time Magazine, The Washington Post, Business Insider, Huffington Post, Stucky was a huge deal. According to academics like Francesca Coppa, Stucky represented an opposition to the traditionally straight male dominated world of comic books. The Stucky fandom was a place where queer and non-male people expressed themselves through fan work. It wasn't just about these two white dudes. These online spaces offered solace to thousands of queer people who couldn't outwardly express their identity otherwise. GLAAD, an organization that advocates for LGBTQ representation in the media, stated that it's getting increasingly difficult to ignore that LGBT people remain almost completely shut out of Hollywood's big budget comic films that have dominated the box office over the past couple of years. We've met with several activists who've noted the power of US media in their country and how the conversations have changed there. A lot of people saw Stucky as a moment to change the conversation and the US and abroad about what superhero fandom looked like as a whole. This isn't to say that Bucky represented some singular light of queer representation that's totally perfect. The caucasity of that argument is beyond what I'm capable of articulating. But these big budget films and the discourse surrounding them definitely has the power to shift conversations about representation. 
the Marvel-affiliated response was mostly positive, but a lot of Marvel people definitely reiterated that creatives intended to portray a platonic relationship. Of course, that didn't stop people like Joe Russo from proclaiming Stucky as a love story, and on platonic love stories. What's with all this insistent on platonic love stories with same-gendered relationships? Kirk and Spock, Merlin and Arthur, all hidden under this label of love story until it comes time to appease the heterosexuals. Could this ambiguous labeling ever happen with a pairing between a man and a woman? In dealing with a fictional straight relationship, could people just as easily throw around words like love story, portray a deep relationship on film, notice mass fan support, and still affirm a completely platonic interpretation? Or would executives force the pairing together? There's nothing wrong with platonic love stories, but why does this label apply so selectively? For producers, queerness only exists as an interpretation that could never come to fruition but it's an interpretation to capitalize on. Essentially, with the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Marvel inherited a widely recognized and impactful fan base of people interested in the sexuality and identity of these characters. A perfect setup for a queer bait. Check. Now that they had a fan base, what did they do with it? So Captain America is gone. He decided to run off with Peggy Carter in another timeline, and now his friends Sam and Bucky are left to mourn the absence of their crush. Steve left his shield with Sam as a way to encourage Sam to take on his role, but Sam decided to give the shield away. Now here we are. At the beginning of the show, Sam offered some wise words. We need new heroes. One suited for the times we're in. That's an important statement that could mean a lot of things. But let's think about the essence of that statement. Changing times need changing heroes. If we write stories about exceptional people, these stories should reflect the fact that exceptional people come from a diverse set of backgrounds. Exceptional people aren't always, or even mostly, white, straight, cisgender men. Trans people, people of color, non-straight people, and the intersections of all of these experiences matter. Sam. Wouldn't it be great if we had queer heroes? Wouldn't it be great if Marvel didn't tell about 5% or so of the population that they didn't exist, especially if this population seems to grow with every generation? I totally agree with you, Sam. The show also reintroduces Bucky, Steve's BFF BF. Now that Steve's gone, Bucky feels lost. He's trying to pay for his past crimes, but his haunted past lingers on. He doesn't have many friends. He's ignoring Sam's texts. It's a difficult time for him. We get a little glimpse of his love life. Bucky agrees to go on a date with this person named Leia. We're shown Bucky's old-fashioned and even rusty dating skills. He brings flowers. He hasn't danced since 1943. He hasn't kissed anyone since Steve. Part of him clings to a past. A ferociously homophobic past that's hard to break out of. Now on their date, something happens that changes everything. Bucky talks about his experiences with online dating, and he says this. I, um, try the whole online dating thing. It's pretty crazy. A lot of weird pictures. What kind of weird? I mean, tiger photos. A pretty innocuous line on its surface, right? But if you think about it, it's kind of confusing. On its own, the line doesn't really work as an isolated joke because of its specificity. So it's got to be a reference, right? What's the reference? Well, it turns out that it's actually pretty common to pose with a tiger for the pictures that you put on dating apps like Tinder. Pretty common for men to pose with a tiger on Tinder. Apparently, a few years ago, there was this big trend of men on Tinder posing with tigers for their profile pictures. Plenty of publications covered the trend, and if you google tiger photos dating app, you'll get plenty of results about the male tiger pics. So, the implication should be clear. Bucky was looking at men's dating profiles. Or he's a furry. Otherwise, this line literally doesn't make sense. And this is Marvel. 30 executives in suits and hundreds of unpaid interns scrutinize this script to make sure it's suitable for the market. 
So how did a reference to Bucky's bisexual dating life slip through? Am I reading too much into it? Only as much as my liberal arts education put me in debt to do so. But you can't get around this point. This is a reference to Bucky looking at men's dating profiles. And there's no way Marvel had absolutely no way of knowing that. We'll come to this point later on in the video, but for now, I'm just reading the text. So Bucky starts feeling guilty during the date and he dips to go look at more men on Tinder. Some time passes and we get to episode two and we learn something terrible. There's a new Captain America. They replace Steve with the white boy in your class playing devil's advocate. Bucky's mad at this whole Captain read the room situation. He's mad at Sam for giving up that shield. The last physical object reminding Bucky of the night Steve held him in his arms. In fact, he stops ghosting Sam and runs to confront him. This isn't what Steve wanted. But confronting someone about a mutual past lover is gonna be an emotional experience. We're not just dealing with gay staring here. This calls for an analysis of advanced gay staring. Advanced gay staring. And they stare so much. I almost doubted myself. I thought, okay, Alex, maybe this is an appropriate level of staring for a non-platonic situation. Maybe it's straight. But of course, Sam had to point out, All right, they use brute force, just like you. The incredibly annoying guy in front of me with the staring prop. I'm coming with you. No, you're not. Right. So it's a habit, especially when Sam's around. But the belligerent sexual tension continues. It turns out Sam has to go stop these villain people. Now, when Bucky hears about this, he says, I'm coming with you. And Sam is like, Oh, no, you're not. But since Sam is dangerously attracted to Bucky, somehow the man convinces him. And what happens? Oh, oh, so, so they're just staring again. Okay. Are you sure it's just Bucky with the staring problem, Sam? What's going on here? Suddenly they're in Germany, but they're still staring at each other? Are you telling me they stared at each other in gay silence the entire way to Germany? Excuse me? So the staring thing isn't necessarily a Sam and Bucky exclusive thing. When Bucky encounters Captain Capitalist Hegemony, he also engages in a bit of intense staring. She always just stare like that? You get used to it. But the level of intensity is pretty exclusive to Sam and Bucky. Who's the only one to return the stare? Who's the only man that Bucky shared transcontinental homoeroticism with? It's clear that the intensity behind Bucky's stares take on a different hue with Sam. Let's be clear. Pain and resentment underlie the international homosexual agenda between Sam and Bucky. Bucky's still pissed at Sam for the whole shield thing. Sam even tries to reach out, but Bucky's still hesitant about the romantic advances. Enjoy your ride, Buck. No, you can't call me that. Why not? That's what Steve called you. Steve knew me longer, and Steve had a plan. 15 seconds to drop! Bucky wants to clearly differentiate Sam and Steve. These two lovers can't intersect. Bucky idealizes Steve's perfections in his mind, but Sam stands before him as a real but flawed old friend. I wonder if the show challenges Bucky's insistence on separating Sam and Steve later on. Hint. Yes. And I wonder if the fact of Bucky's previous romantic tension with Steve somehow parallels Sam and Bucky's romantic tension. Hint. Probably. We get some classic queer moments on the mission, some close proximity staring, playful teasing over the intercom, demonstrations of their chemistry, nothing explicitly and inherently homosexual, but when you put the moments in the context with the story, the queer intentions become pretty obvious. Oh, and they roll around in a field together. Oh, and uh, Bucky lingers on top of Sam. Listen, I know they're like falling in style or whatever here, but think about the suggestion, the trope. A lot of romance stories include that scene where someone falls on someone and there's this weird, oh, I'm kind of into it moment. That might be what we're seeing here. So after they literally fall in love, they go and visit this old man named Isaiah Bradley. Unfortunately, to keep this video short, we can't get into the details of his backstory, but it's pretty powerful stuff. He does offer a piece of wisdom, which I think reverberates with Bucky's character arc overall. Not a killer anymore. You think you can wake up one day and decide who you want to be? It doesn't work like that. 
This quote means a lot of things, but I think it particularly speaks to Bucky's queer coding. Bucky's tried all his life to fit certain molds, the straight mold of over-the-knee shorts and car insurance. Bucky's afraid of losing control, yet he defers to the external world for approval, the approval of people like Steve. But Bucky needs to start accepting parts of himself even if he finds it uncomfortable. One of those parts may be queerness. The text suggests that he needs to work more for true fulfillment. So with all these queer metaphors and romantic tropes and thinly veiled pretext to gay lovemaking, we eventually cross the point of no return. Cross the Rube Bicon, if you will. The couples therapy scene. So Bucky and Sam aren't always in each other's arms whispering sweet nothings into one another's ears. A lot of the times they're fighting. We get to this scene where Bucky's therapist forces them to reconcile their differences with couples therapy. When I first heard there was a couples therapy scene, I thought that the term was an affectionate name some flamboyant intellectuals on the internet applied liberally to a subtle gay moment. I thought, oh, there's probably a moment where they talk to a therapist and it kind of seems like they're a couple. But no, they literally undergo couples therapy. You'd think I'd be enthusiastic about it. And although I congratulate Bucky and Sam for sorting out their marital strife, I'm left to wonder. This is a gay joke, isn't it? Not a sophisticated 2020s gay joke where it's someone on Twitter making fun of the ways gay people eat candy canes or whatever, but a gay joke where male intimacy is part of the punchline. It's supposed to be funny that they're in a romantic situation. But at the end of the day, unlike a hypothetical straight version of this scene and these characters, the audience knows there's no chance of these dudes getting together. Let's look at the actual scene. We're going to do an exercise. It's something I use with couples when they are trying to figure out what kind of life they want to build. So we get an explicit confirmation. This is couples therapy. Then the therapist asks them to do a soul staring exercise. She encourages them to get closer. Let's do it. Let's stare. Get close. This is a good exercise. Thanks, Don. All right. Good. All right. Get close. Get closer. We, well, which way you want to go? You have to have your right legs open. You know what? Fine. Here. Oh, you happy well, now? All right. All right. Yeah. Good. We're locked That's in. Fine. It's a little close. It's very close. That's what you wanted, right? Guys. <laughs> what do you mean? That's what Bucky wanted. I mean, I know that, Sam. But did Bucky make a confession to you already? They're forced to look in each other's eyes, which isn't difficult for them. So what exactly is the joke here? I mean, part of it is. A simple gay joke. Men being intimate in this economy? But if it is partly a gay joke, that means there's something gay about it, right? It's like a romantic comedy scenario. A movie forces two leads who aren't fond of each other into a wacky romantic situation. Sure, you can take the simple gay joke route and interpret this as Marvel doing a haha, it's gay. But let's think about how one might reclaim the moment. Let's say you're aware that queer people exist. You might even dabble in queerness yourself. How could you not watch this scene and come out the other end with at least a hint of, hey, is it just me? Or were they a little... <laughs> and then you pair that with the tiger photos thing. You pair it with the non-platonic field rolling, with Marvel's history of Stucky. Marvel knows who's watching. And knowing that context, now, what is the purpose of this scene? Now, of course, there's another side to the scene. Bucky confronts Sam about giving away the shield, and he reveals how the decision also reflects Bucky's own insecurities. That is, that is everything he stood for. That is his legacy. He gave you that shield, and you threw it away like it was nothing. Right, so sure. maybe he was wrong about you, and if he was wrong about you, then he was wrong about me. <laughs> Again, Bucky idolizes Steve. This isn't just about the belligerent sexual tension between Sam and Bucky. Bucky's dealing with lost love, lost hope, and lost identity. He has to redefine himself in this new context. And the only one there to help him is Sam. Still, in conversation, Bucky can't accept people labeling him as Sam's partner. You're gonna let your partner walk into a room with a super soldier alone. He's dealt with worse, and he's not my partner. Something is holding Bucky back. 
and unfortunately, it's not Sam's bulging biceps. A lot of homosexually irrelevant stuff happens, but then Sam and Bucky travel to Sam's hometown and interact in a slice of life romantic montage. Sam and Bucky have a little conversation. It's quite revealing. It's just that Shields, closest thing I've got left to a family. So when you retired it, it made me feel like I had nothing left. It made me question everything. You, Steve, me. So again, this shield, it represents some sort of ideal to Bucky. This past he had with Steve, the times Bucky fit into heterosexual American life. But unlike Bucky, Sam holds no attachments to that past. Sam understands that the American ideal throughout history has been an exclusive ideal. It is white, straight, middle, and upper class. In spite of this, Sam still believes he can redefine these exclusive ideals through self-determination. In contrast, Bucky's somewhat stuck in their original meaning. He's stuck in some idealized past that doesn't allow him to self-determine in the ways he could. But Steve is gone. And this might be a surprise, but it doesn't matter what Steve thought. You gotta stop looking to other people to tell you who you are. And that's just it, isn't it? Bucky's got to define his own identity. <coughs> mm, sorry, uh, there's something stuck in my throat. Must be that queer metaphor. You up for a little tough love? Tough love? What kind of services are you offering, Sam? So obviously, this moment is kind of queer-coded. The whole rediscovering and accepting your identity thing just reeks of queerness. After their conversation, they share a bro shake, contextually homosexual smiles, some banter, and for a moment, the tables turn. Gay. Bucky calls them partners. We're professionals, definitely. And uh, we're partners. Co-workers. But we're also a couple guys with a mutual friend. Friends now gone, so we're a couple of guys. I can live with that. Perfect. No, it's actually the reverse. You guys are a couple. But I mean, let's just think about the staring, the arm pat, the slow motion, Bucky letting his guard down, the context of it. In the last episode, we see different developments come to an end. Sam tries to reconcile America's flaws and his decision to take up the role of Captain America. Bucky starts helping others and making a positive impact in the world beyond being a gay emo. Loose ends are tied, sexualities are accepted, and the last shot involves Sam and Bucky literally walking off into a sunset together? Listen, I know. None of this is inherently gay. Staring isn't gay. Holding men isn't gay. Even looking at dudes on Tinder isn't fundamentally gay. The only thing that makes you gay is identifying as gay. But in that same vein, flirting with girls isn't inherently and completely non-queer. Going on a date with a girl doesn't make you straight. Yet, why do we assume, or why do most people assume, that Bucky and Sam's default sexuality is heterosexual? If we strip away the assumptions and look at the context, maybe we can try to understand what Marvel is doing. Why is Marvel showing the things that it does? Marvel hinted at the possibility of positive queerness in the show without following through on any of these promises. More on the specifics later. But were there any explicitly queer moments in the text? There was one. And it was really weird. There's this part of the show where they're like undercover doing non-gay things I don't remember, and they talk to this one criminal lady named Selby. They're hanging with this dude named Zemo, who already occupies this gray space of sexuality called ambiguously European. Now, Zemo basically pretends to offer Bucky as a product to Selby, and his offer is uncomfortably sexual. And I give you him, along with the code words to control him, of course. He will do anything you want. Is this supposed to be a joke? What's the implication between Zemo and Bucky? Bucky has undergone a lot of trauma, and he's clearly uncomfortable with certain levels of intimacy. Yet here we are, 
playing with his sexuality because haha it's funny when men are offered as pieces of meat for coercion? Why is this the only explicit and intentional queerness in the entire show? No, a beautiful healthy love story between Sam and Bucky would be too much, but this weird power play is totally fine. Now if we take everything offered in this show, between the stolen glances and the romantic tropes, I think it's safe to say that we can mark off the homoeroticism bullet point on the queerbaiting model. The possibility of hinted queerness in text? We've got tiger photos, we've got sexual and romantic tension between the leads, we've got gay jokes, romantic tropes, queer-coded character arcs. I'd say... check. Let's go... fishing. So what do we do with this? What's the plan? What would happen if, let's say you asked show creator Malcolm Spellman about Bucky's sexuality? Oh, well, when the Tiger Photo episode came out, that's exactly what someone did. Um, I wanted to ask about this because there has been some chatter in the MCU for the last few years about whether Bucky is bisexual or queer. Interviewer Eamon Warman of NME asked Malcolm Spellman about Bucky's sexuality. Here's how it went. He had that line in the first episode about tiger pictures, which are primarily, I think, found on men's profiles. So is that question going to be definitively answered? What, what was the purpose of that line? Cannot get like, you just got to, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not diving down rabbit holes, but uh, just keep watching. What do you mean rabbit hole? What rabbit hole? It's a line from your show. Is it a rabbit hole because Marvel believes queerness could never be anything more than speculation detached from people with lived identities? Now Spellman was pretty dismissive of the interviewer in this piece because he didn't want to reveal spoilers about the show. Notice how he says, Just keep watching. He said that to almost everything the interviewer asked because the implication was, Keep watching and your questions will be answered. So when the interviewer asked about queerness, Spellman responded, <laughs> <laughs> Keep watching. And in the end, what did we get? Where was the confirmation? Why wouldn't Spellman answer the question in the first place if the question isn't gonna be answered in the show? Why tiger photos, Malcolm? Now, if Bucky wasn't queer, and the tiger photos thing had a perfectly heterosexual explanation, why didn't Spellman elaborate? Why did he just laugh and suggest that we would get an answer? It's because it's bait. Creators encourage this type of speculation to drive fan interest in a work. If he straight up just said, yeah, Bucky's straight, then I'm sure a lot of viewers would have been less engaged and ran off to the next ambiguously gay thing. But Spellman didn't confirm anything. He left queer viewers with a tiny sliver of hope. And while queer viewers time and time again hope that Marvel will make that big leap and start those conversations about queerness in the mainstream, Queer viewers understand it's fruitless. Literally, they keep straight washing all the fruits. Will we ever get bisexual Bucky Barnes? Or is that just a meaningless alliteration? Well, if we aren't, then the move, Marvel, is to stop pretending like something's gonna happen. Yes, I'd be disappointed, but at least I can reserve the little hope that I have for something else. So what was the bullet point again? Ah, yes. Legitimate sources, writers, producers, and actors hinting at queerness in the text. So Malcolm Spellman winking at the gaze? Check. Why do I spend so much energy defending Marvel's homoerotic military propaganda? Who cares if Malcolm Spellman played into the hopes of young queer people, right? There's a big queer audience watching. A lot of the most fervent fans of this series are teenagers, online, trying to figure out their identity through fictional queer spaces. In my conservative hometown, queerness wasn't really talked about. When I was 8 years old, I remember driving by a long line of people on the side of the street, all of them holding up anti-gay marriage posters. It signaled to me that my identity wasn't something I could speak about openly with the locals. Online LGBTQ fandoms were one of the first spaces I was able to play with my identity. 
Marvel capitalizes on these fandoms, the same spaces I discovered how to articulate my identity. They are playing with the feelings of young queer people. These shipping communities, as silly as they can be, do real work in challenging what mainstream comic fandom looks like. Now, yes, a lot of people in these fandoms don't really go beyond spending a lot of time talking about how much white men love to touch each other on primetime. Even in that case, where should we really aim our criticism? Should we condemn a bunch of teens on the internet for liking popular media? Or should we place more pressure on big media companies to portray diverse stories? Shouldn't we take the popularity of queer ships as an indication that big productions lack queer representation? In some ways, Marvel has made decent strides in creating a diverse set of characters and leads. Sure, there's always good criticisms to be made of these big media companies. But while these companies exist, we can at least encourage these small crumbs of representation that we get. They do make a big impact. I think Sam Wilson as Captain America is a good moment for diversity on screen. These role models are incredibly important. So let's push Marvel further. These blockbusters have at least some power in shifting international conversations. It's something. At least give us something. If Marvel is going to play with queerness, but then set aside queerness when it's inconvenient, then we need to have a talk. You can't just put a story out there, giggle and encourage your queer fans to keep watching, and then act like these little hints meant absolutely nothing. It can't be nothing anymore. I don't get to stop being queer when it's inconvenient. I hope I'm wrong, but even if I'm wrong about this specific moment, this still speaks to a larger trend. The point of this channel isn't to gush over the homosexual agenda's latest studs. I mean, it's a little bit of that, but there's a bigger story. I want to give young queer people the tools to analyze fiction, reclaim the stories they've been gaslit out of, and hopefully channel that energy to push for broader representation. Bisexual Bucky Barnes won't solve everything. Sam and Bucky's love story won't end homophobia. But we're also not going to end it with ambiguous glances and uncertain interviews. So are they gay? Are Sam and Bucky in love? What is Anthony Mackie thinking about? When will Sam share his angsty Spotify playlist? Are Sam and Bucky gay, bi, pan, ace, trans, or something else entirely? You decide. Hey, gay. You want to act gaily daily? Well, here's a few ways you can do that. Support this channel by checking out my merch at www.itsall.gay or consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, remember to follow my Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe. Anyways, these are some people who are acting gaily daily. My patrons. Wick Tor. Delaney Broom. Elizabeth Acosta. Some Odd Thing. Bylet. Amara. Marie Jean Boyer. Cole Jackson. Al Wilson. Jay Patrick. Sydney Smeets. Kebu. Steffi. Knights Who Say Sledge. Enardo Dominguez Elvina. Anna Tchaikovska. Etienne. Jessica Carmona. Night Tripping Fairy. Alexa. John Pattison, Tanya P, Rowan, EEE, -E -E, DT McQueen, Nessocat, Akari Dango, Amari Rome, Gary K, Evan P, Sean O'Neill, Owl7, CC Troyeux, Corvus Blair, Violet Fabiana, Sydney, Adrienne Jackson, K, Maddie Reyes, Alexander Bell, Cody Miller, Juicebox08, Surika Nikulin, Cooper, The Kimchi Witch, Cucumber, AFK Bard, Feeler, the Foster 24, Ryro, Del Elliott, Charlotte, Alexina, Megalomaniac 64, Polina Rakitska, Zetotron, Marie, Whitney Welts, Mally Drew G, 